Good afternoon. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Sharon. And I'm here with Diana. And we are um, part two of the 14 team members of Isn't It Romantic Book Club. And today we have a very, very special event. We have Sonali Dev coming um, coming on live today. Um, I, I again, my name is Sharon Ray. I write the Deadly Force Romantic Suspense series. My current book, In Search of Truth, is currently out. And I'm going to pass it over to Diana right now. Hi everyone, uh, Diana Mignot Stewart here. Uh, I write romantic suspense for The Strong of Heart. And Sharon and I are so excited to talk with Sonali today. We both love this book. I, I mean, it just it. blew us away. <laughs> so let me just read um, Sonali's bio real quick and introduce her. Award-winning author Sonali Depp writes Bollywood-style love stories that let her explore issues faced by women around the world while still indulging her faith in happily ever after. Sonali's novels have been on Library Journal, NPR, Washington Post, and Kirkus Best Books of the Year list. She has won the American Library Association's for Best Romance, the RT Reviewer's Choice Award for Best Contemporary Romance, the RT Seal of Excellence, and is a Rita finalist. Sonali lives in Chicago suburbs with her very patient and often amused husband and two teens who demand both patience and humor. And she also has the world's most perfect dog. So, <laughs> welcome. Hi, Sonali. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's always it's it's always fun to start everything out with my you know Simba. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here with us today, Sonali. Thank you. It's so great to see you, <laughs> both of you. Well, you know, I, I don't think that um, it would be right for us to just jump into everything without mentioning what is happening in the world right now and um, our support for the Black Lives Matter movement and for, you know, uh, our fellow authors, um, you know, people of color who ha are out there and, you know, promoting um, things to for equality and, and justice. And um, so we just wanted to say that straight out to make sure that, um, you know, we showed our support. Did you guys have anything to add? No, I think you said it beautifully, yeah. Diana. And I can't wait to start talking about Sonali's book because yeah, I absolutely you know, loved it. Yeah, and I think that so you- I do actually have- Oh, I'm sorry, sorry Sonali. No, I'm just, I'm just gonna say, you know, to add to that, that um, that we're out here promoting our books and it feels a little disingenuous sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and um, you know, we're still doing it, uh, even though we're calling it disingenuous. So, um, so, so absolutely, I think, um, you know, go out and uh, support Black artists and support um, Black authors. There's some gorgeous, gorgeous romance that has just come out, um, you know, from Black authors with um, Black characters that I think everyone should read. The day that Recipe for Persuasion came out, Queen Move by Kennedy Ryan came out and just hit the USA Today uh, in it's its first week out. And it is such a gorgeous book in everything she writes. And Farah, you know, I don't want to forget uh, if we don't get to the recommendation section, if you have it, but uh, Farah Roshan's uh, The Boyfriend Project is coming out next week. Kwan and I can oh, drop great. links in the comment section for all of, of yeah. these. Yeah. Um, and and, and uh, Kwana Jackson, sorry, Kwana Jackson's um, Real Men Knit is out uh, in May also. So a lot of really lovely May books. Make sure you pick those up and uh and you know vocally um show your support but also with your dollars yes definitely thank you for that i appreciate it thank you Sally. and we will drop links for all those books and more um in the comments section later on yes um <laughs> okay can, let's let's start with recipe for for persuasion. Sonali, i had just have to i'm going to start with saying that persuade i was telling diana earlier persuasion was the first jane austen book i ever read and so it has always been my favorite and everyone loves Pride and Prejudice and it's a great book, but nothing in my heart has ever held a place as close to it as Persuasion. So I was so excited to read this book and I thought you hit the emotional tenor that I felt when I read Persuasion when I was like 14 or 15, you hit it with this book and in such a beautiful way because the first book only had one point of view and this one has multiple points of view and I felt like you hit it with every character. So I just want to say that. 
That is so sweet. Yeah, the first book did have two. It had both Elizabeth. Oh, and did it? Oh, see, I don't even remember because I just read <laughs> hers. <laughs> yeah, and this one has the three. But, but you know, I'm so glad you said that. And I'm actually amazed at how many people have been saying to me that Persuasion is their favorite, you know, Jane Austen book. Um, and I'm always like, that's amazing. I think it's her most emotionally intense and her yes. most romantic book, obviously her most romantic book. And and I think what I was really going for, because these books are not retellings in terms of, you know, scene to scene or even right. uh, character to character. It's uh, if you've never heard of Persuasion, it's going to change nothing for you when you read this book, because, you know, it, they, they completely are their own story. But having said that, really what I was trying to achieve uh, was paying, you know, was was paying homage. It, this book is an ode, is my ode to that letter that Captain Wentworth writes. So, yes. so you know, emotional tenor. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because that was exactly what I was going for. Oh, well, you hit it perfectly. I, I, you know, I was trying to cry during this book and I was weeping at the end of it. <laughs> Um, you did such a great job with the mother-daughter relationship. That was such that an important piece of it. Um, do you have a close relationship with your children? Do you feel that, um, you know, our children so often see us one way in the world? Do you, do you feel that our mothers and mothering, sometimes you get um, maybe identified as uh, the mother figure and not as the person? Oh, I mean, of course. Of course, and that is their, uh, you know, prerogative, absolutely. And um, and and it's really strange for them, for those of us who, you know, do things like this, where we're, you know, not huge public figures, but you know, we're out, out and about, and saying right. things, and doing things, and people seem to be interested. And that's always really weird, I think, for children, as I'm sure both of you have experienced with your own mm -hmm. children. And you have to keep, I think, those two things, at least until they become full-fledged adults, you know, keeping those two things uh, separate. At least I feel um, like, you know, it's, it's important for them because a child's spotlight should be the child. And so mm -hmm. that's some of the things that I was exploring in uh, this book was that also, right? I mean... But but again, from a different lens, from from the feminine and the feminist lens, I think, because this book is certainly, I think, as much a love story of Ashna and her mother as it is a love agree. story, you know, of uh, Rico and Ashna. But I will also say that uh, having said that, it's the story of what happens, like the thing that really, you know, that I, I usually have something that disturbs me that I'm trying to unwrap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm the story and and what i was trying to unwrap in this is is women and i think women across the world certainly women in um in my culture it uh, are are taught this narrative that you put others before you mm -hmm. and um and and it's your risk everyone's happiness your children not everyone's but your family's happiness is on your shoulders and um and if you slip up the impact is devastating for those you need to be nurturing and taking care of. And mm -hmm. I think this is the narrative that women have been fed, right? You have to be the perfect mother. You don't get to slip up. You have to be the perfect wife. You have to be the perfect, you know, homemaker, all of that, because those things are so important to the people under your care. And, and what happens when a woman says that, you know, what about my needs? Not in a selfish way, but in a way where her needs are yanked away from her, right? Which also happens so much. Um, and and what, what if she says that, you know, no, I'm going to actually give my own needs and desires and what I want a chance. And, and she's told that, you know, you will destroy your family. And she does because there is co collateral damage. That's the way our world is set up, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and that collateral damage is her daughter. You know, this right. is well, I felt like, yeah, that was uh, actually a, a love story for all women because I do yeah. feel, I felt that very, very deeply how, you know, we have to make those choices all the time, you know, between our family and career. And sometimes there is a lot of guilt involved in that. And well, all the time. Had collateral yeah. damage, you can't be there all the time 
for your child if you're doing something else. Yeah, exactly. And and the question that you asked before is is so spot on because we do it, right? I mean, you have to make you know walk that balance bef- between saying you know, this is mom's career. This is really important. This is, a, especially since what we do is blood, sweat and tears, you know, right? Yeah. it literally is, you know, raising children is yanking your heart out and writing books is yanking your heart out. Mm-hmm. And, and we do have to balance that. And while the children, you know, when they're younger, especially deserve to be the center of their own universe, mm-hmm. you know, being able to tell them that no mom giving time to her work is not, is not abandonment it's the onus is on us to do that right yeah right so yeah. Uh, children are always yeah. different like i have one um who who would come if i'm if i'm working she would actually push my la- when she needs me she can push the laptop away get on top of me and say you're my <laughs> she actually used to say this and it's a joke now she's like you're my mommy not the book's mommy <laughs> <laughs> and she would say that but she had that personality when when she needed me she could yank me out of what i'm doing and take her time my 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 other one doesn't have that personality and so you know so it it it's another walk to walk where it is while still giving my you know my entire attention to the work i'm doing it was it of course it you know it was also important to make sure that that he didn't feel abandoned right, right. and you know so so as mothers i think we're doing it doing that constantly we should be doing that constantly we do it much more than the fathers do i you know i mean i'm just going to put it out there and say it yes yeah, yeah i would um, agree and and that's what this is about it's like you know the the rules you know and and we're fed those rules so right. young that the issue becomes us even if there's someone who's not telling you you need to do x it doesn't matter because in my mind i'm a, i'm a failure if I don't do it. Right. And, right. and the father uh, in the story, you know, he's has all these issues and is not there as well, but he is excused over and over and over again. And you see how fa- unfair that is. And what's right. important is he excuses himself. Like yeah. he doesn't he it's it's in fact he's appalled. Like his whole relationship with the world is like how dare I not be the center of everyone's universe. Mm-hmm. No but, what. You, but you unfolded that beautifully because in the very beginning of the book, you don't get that. Like you, yeah. she's so sad about her father's death. She's so committed to her father's, you yeah. know, um, and for and for the readers who haven't read it yet, her father owned owned a um, a fine dining Indian restaurant called uh, Curry Dreams, mm-hmm. and the daughter takes it over after his death. And you don't get in the beginning that there's all this. Like she, you mention it a little bit that you know his background, where he'd come from, and that they finally. But you just assume that since they finally set him up with that restaurant, the family, that things were good. good. And so that you did a great job unfolding that things weren't quite what. Yeah. There, yeah. and that just shows you how much in her own mind, in Ashna's own mind, she knows. I mean, she's building this construct that things were good. Yeah. To protect yeah. herself. And and she has to, right? I mean, we all have to, and children certainly have to. Yes. Um, and it's always really strange and painful to write someone who is, you know, who has had to go through this kind of horrific marriage in you know, in their um mm-hmm. you know, in their childhood, because it's such a real part of our world, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's the the there's at least as many horrific marriages as there are not, you know, and uh, and and um, and and we kind of make the assumption. And again, I don't mean this as people, you know, should stick in a marriage just because children will be. Right. Miserable. But but often adults don't take the time to, you know, or if they're taking the time to think about how their actions impact, you know, a, a, because a child is, you know, doesn't have the the armors built. To handle, right. you know, what we're handling in adulthood, and so it's it's getting inside, you know, the head of someone who has had had, you know, internalized that because mm-hmm. we, you know, it's easy to say, oh, she, you know, she's an empath, but but children are very empathetic yes. naturally. You know, they find a way to. We all build build our, you know, desensitize ourselves as we grow. But children are empaths, so they're yes. constantly picking up. Uh, you know the pain of their parents who are their entire universe so so certainly i think you know for me that journey walking that with ashna was um 
was interesting but um but everyone who starts or often readers have you know texted me after starting the book and saying i hate shobi and i hope she kick, like this is a clear text i hope she kicks her to the curb you know grows his spine to kick her mom to the curb and i'm like just keep reading <laughs> well that's the brilliance of the book of how you unfolded the story between you know, of all of these different generations and all of the you know, all of the things that had happened to them in their life and shaped who they were and what my one of my all time favorite scenes was when um her aunt and her mom it's towards the end and she's chucking the ring out the window and then there's a conversation with you she's upset her mother's upset, and she's all of a sudden asha says i just chucked a three carat diamond out the window and all the women run downstairs and somehow that scene ends up talking about orgasms and how, <laughs> and how she asha doesn't want to hear it because the older women in her life like will never have sex like, <laughs> and it was just i really thought you tied together all the emotion the emotional journey of the story was tied together of the theme of the women in that scene i i love that you say that because what you were saying before this right that our kids see us as and that's exactly what she yes. said right you know we're not we're not one note you know we're more than just your mothers we have orgasms right <laughs> yes. yes. no, no, and no, we no. like diamonds I, like i was my first thought was she chucked like, so as the scenes are falling like but the diamonds outside like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and i think i love every time shobhi and meena are on the page together yes. i think is magic for me mm -hmm. because so much of the magic in this book for me is um is women supporting women and and you know how um uh, how there is no way for us to have a meaningful journey as a woman if we don't find that mm -hmm. you know and which is which is not to negate women who may not have it i mean you know everyone finds their own meaning but but i just feel like to me in my own life it's it's in every little thing i'm supported by my mom my aunt right. my mother in law yeah. you know my sisters in law my daughter my grandmothers like right. that's that's you know who i am is entirely their love and the ways in which they love me and i feel like with with um with shobi and meena uh how they choose to handle the world both women who have you know uh, things to deal with from their childhood you know darkness to deal with and, uh, and and unquestioningly how they support each other when there's such different women and you know the way that they manifest in the world is so different but i love that they are you know that they're able to say that and they banter and another one of my favorite scenes is on the balcony when they're the young uh, you know young oh. kids and um and i just like it's so so every time they were on the page it was magic and i had so much fun with that well it also helped give me hope for show like i was once you realize that because you love Mina immediately, right? Yeah. And and I think there's even a line where she said, This is how you parent, right? This from Asha's right. point right. of view. And I thought, well, if me if Mina has found something to love in Shobi, there must be something to love in her. Yeah. Right. So so that's why I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna let Sonali figure this out. Right. <laughs> Trust her with that. <laughs> well, they really understood each other's pain. And yes, I think as the story unraveled and we understood all of the characters pain that's really when you had the deep connection with everyone you know and i have to say i just loved rico so much i adored oh, him oh i loved him <laughs> thank you what's not to love oh i know <laughs> it's not to love i just and, and you know he was such a perfect wentworth do you know what i mean like he in his own way with all of the insecurities and all the sweetness and all the gruffness you know all all of that wrapped up yeah he was yeah. again you know such a joy to write it was he was an easy easy hero to write you know i mean i have um i i have heroes who who have been hard to write but 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 wentworth is just such a hero's hero like he's yeah. you know the ultimate um romance hero and um it's it's really it, it's it's gold to have that material so so there were things um 
you know, things specifically that were Wentworthish that I was going for. I mean, of course, he is very much himself, but um, but I needed him to be, you know, a warrior of some sort mm -hmm. um, in in terms of personality, not in terms of action. And and uh, and he needed to be a celebrity for obvious reasons because the right. show, is, you know, right. because the book is set on a show where that you know on a Food Network show that is called Cooking with the Stars, and it's uh, for those who haven't read it which is like dancing with the stars but with cooking so it's a chef and a celebrity so he had to be a celebrity it had to be the kind of celebrity that is not uh that's not focused on appearances so mm -hmm. so you know the narcissism it is that is naturally part of certain kinds of right celebrity had to not be there it had to be the love of something else you know which is the love of a sport not that actors don't have the love of acting but it's different right i mean the right. the 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 warriorness of a game you know where at that point only that matters the the winning or losing and so so it's a personality trait and so rico was naturally you know an athlete and uh, and then of course i was trying to figure out what sport and and yeah, I, how much do you know about football <laughs> soccer <laughs> so i am not at all um I'm actually uh, vehemently uh, opposed to, uh, and people are going to hate me. Please read my book anyway. But I'm, I'm, I, I have a lot of issues with making athletes into gods. You know, making mm -hmm. anyone into, you know, musicians. Um, that came actors. across in what you were writing, though. I really got that impression, and and yeah, he didn't like it. Like he didn't like being in that position. He didn't take it very seriously. And I thought that was so endearing. He he took the game seriously. Right, and that's right. the best thing about being an athlete is is that that every top level athlete, all the other stuff apart, you know, it's in their eyes you know, when they're standing in front of that goal or it's in their eyes when they have that cricket bat in their hand or, you know, whatever the equivalent of right. that is in other sports. What what I what I have issues with is that we turn them into gods and, and the you know, and the enterprise of it, you know, everything that's happened with taking the knee and, and the NFL. And, and, you know, so all of that for me personally is, you know, is like and, and I have fa families. My son played football for many years. Of course, I didn't understand the game at all because I was not interested. I went to every one of his games and I'm like, what is he doing? Where, why? Where is he running? Why is there a flag here? It was a complete mess. I, you know, the first time I sent him for practice, he was in third grade or fourth grade because we live in a town where, you know, it's very much football culture might also be my you know reason for not loving it because i've seen you know how that whole jock culture isn't so great even for mm -hmm. kids yeah. growing up and boys and what we're teaching them and all of that but anyway different conversation i actually sent this child to a game with all his pads in those pants in the wrong places oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so his coach was like ah uh, yes, <laughs> I think we might need Funny. to start with a lesson on where the pads go. And I was, you know, because they have them on the knees and the butt, and you know, I've had, yeah, yeah. That's so, oh, that's funny. Experience. Yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, so I was, you know, I grew up with a with a football mad brother, and uh, and I was much more, much less. Um, averse to team sport as a young person because you know peer pressure we grew up in a world where cricket stars and football stars were a very big deal my my brother's room was literally covered from floor to ceiling in in you know football player posters maradona we had like a we had a floor to ceiling just maradona poster right in his room and things like that so so um and of course the story called for a sport that takes him away you know, for yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and I didn't want it to be that she's in San Francisco and he's playing in, you know, New York. Right. That was beautifully done. Yeah, and that was it. really what really well done. I love the fact that when he, when we first, in his point of view, you know, we see his anguish, and he has this person that he he has never forgotten, but she did him wrong. So when yeah. we first come into the situation, we think, well, what could she have done? Uh, and I just love that how the two female characters were considered to to have, um, you know, to to not be to be insensitive or to have done something wrong. And then at the end, when you go through it all, you kind of get to see that that's not the case. Right.
I'm sorry. I have friends. Oh, don't worry about it. Take, sorry. I'm going to. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I, I really did appreciate, and I know that you said that you had, you know, every book you write, you are trying to unravel something. So in this one, you were trying to unravel the, the role of motherhood and women in general and how we are kind of um, take on everybody's pain. And we have, uh, you know, standards that are applied to us that aren't applied to other people. So you're working on something else now. So what is the issue in there? Can you... So so one, I'm still, you know, the, 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 the process of writing helps you uh, figure that out. But mm -hmm. the next one that I'm doing is Sense and Sensibility. And it is Yash's story. So he's running for, you know, he's running oh, for yeah. now. And, um, and I don't know how much I'm allowed to talk about this, but he's running. He, he's, this, is, this is a character who's had his entire life laid out for him mm -hmm. you know, since birth because this family is, you know, the Indian Kennedys and their, their oldest son, you know, they're, 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 this is the guy who carries the legacy of the family. Right. And and so, um, so he knows exactly what his life is going to be like. And the book starts with an assassination attempt oh. where, you know, his where his bodyguard takes a bullet for him and it changes how he sees everything wow and, and so then it is so so it's basically you know again edward ferris so sense and sensibility for me while i love the book is um is is the most flawed of austin's books and i that that's a huge thing for me to say because i completely ideal you know idolize her but but in terms of and i don't think that it was flawed at the time but but if you you know, translating it into now, because it is the story of a man who is committed to somebody mm -hmm. who falls in love with someone else. And that mm -hmm. brings us to, you know, what really is commitment? Is mm -hmm. it the words you say? Or is it what you do? Because Sense and Sensibility says Edward Ferris never cheated. But he spends all that time with Eleanor. Right. You know, and he allows, he puts her and himself in a position where they fall in love. And and he was committed, so he isn't quite the gentleman that you know that that Jane is trying to tell us he is, and Eleanor believes that he is. Because then you're just saying it's the words, you know, and mm. and the actions that matter, and the feelings don't matter, right? You know, and and the intent does not matter, and so those are the things I'm kind of trying to rewrite in a way that feels rele relevant and right to me so so yash is someone who has you know for the whole for the world to see is in a relationship has been in a relationship with someone for 10 years and and you know during this book we find out what that was but after this assess you know after this uh, this thing that happens he um it becomes really difficult for him to go out in public and you know because he he, he basically right. the whole thing breaks down and um and he can't go to a therapist because they don't you know you they, nobody's going to vote for a man who's you right. know Barely, right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> no one's going to vote for a brown man who's having panic attacks for sure and so um and and so the, his sister's friend is India Dashwood, who is China Dashwood's sister. She's she owns a yoga studio. She's the foremost stress management guru in the Bay Area, and you know, so she, so they take him to her because the family trusts her. And of course, it is you know that story of of thinking your your path is set. And then coming to a point where you find out that maybe that's not the path you want to follow, and I, and so that's the exploration. And of course, what is you know what does telling the truth mean? Because we manipulate ourselves so much, mm. in, you know, in in um, in in trying to be truthful because we're always conveniently truthful. It's become completely accepted, you know. And and so these are two characters who are actually concerned with truth. She especially is. And and so they're constantly um, you know, constantly calling out when somebody is twisting that. Is that really the truth or you know, or or are you is it a technicality? Because we tell yeah. you know, and so that's what it is. It's a technicality. Oh, Edward Ferris didn't cheat. But is that 
the truth or is that just a technicality, right? And right, so right. And I think you you explore that a little bit in this book when you talked about, you know, um, the ability to stay in the moment. Because I feel like if you are in the moment, if you're invested in where you're at, then you tend to be more honest. But I think that, you know, there is this, um, you know, persona that people have to put on to go on camera, to go on, you know, right. the show. And I, yeah, yeah. And like, so are you going to tell China's story? Because like in Sense of Sensibility, there were two love stories. I mean, one was secondary, but are you going to do a secondary story in that? Yes, absolutely, it's India and China's story. And so so China is Marianne. Uh, okay. Edward. It's it's more focused on, uh, on you know, on Edward and Eleanor. Because right. And Ch uh, Yash in India. But um, but yes, there is a there's a full full fledged side story with oh, good. Uh, with China and Song and uh, someone else. So will we see more of the backstories of of the family, like the Anne, and learn more of you know of you Mina know, and? Um, I feel so. Of course, Mina and Sri are very invested in Yash's success. Right. And Mina always being being the matriarch or being the you know being everybody you know the ma is um, is you know certainly comes up a lot. And then Yash has a very interesting relationship with his father because he's the center of his father's universe for reasons. And his father has always stood up for him one hundred percent, right? Right. But the the mantle of expectation and the ability to I mean the the permission to to fail never being given ever and so so he has you know which is all of all of yash's personality and a lot of the raji kids personality which is they're very very they've been raised to be very aware of their privilege to a point where you know to a point where it's their guilt because because they're not right right you know unlike their father or their fathers who were literal princes so you know they grew up in a palace and they accept their own privilege a little bit more easily than these kids who are growing up in america and are quintessentially american so mm -hmm. so so their royal heritage is almost something that they all they see completely differently than uh, you know than the way their parents did and i think that i'm kind of trying to explore that as a general experience for immigrant kids where you know i mean all all children have what you know have a distance from the experience of their parents that's just right. you know a, a, a human condition thing but when you're an immigrant and and then you're you're actually tangibly the experiences are so different the world you grow up grew up in and so so there is this translation that happens between immigrant parents and kids where you have to explain things to your children i mean they internalize it mm -hmm. But but right. but there is like such different settings and such different thought processes that go along with uh, you know with those experiences yeah. that 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 communication has to you know there's a silent level silent layer to that communication which right. happens automatically and then each parent and child decides you know how much of because there are parents who say oh the kids don't need you know I don't want to yeah. talk. And right. and there are parents who are like, no, you need to understand. You need to understand why I freak out when this happens. You need to understand why this is hard for me to understand. You know, and and, um, and that's, I, that's fascinating because now that I hear you talking, I realize that that was kind of Ash, Ash's journey too. That she had to take what she had known from her father, and then try something different. I think it was actually. Um, yeah try one thing different, do one thing different to break the cycle and to become her own person. So keeping a, a, a bit of the past and then carving her own way. Yeah. And then, you, and then you add in just the whole, the generational difference in technology like that. <laughs> nothing separates the generations now. I mean, besides all the emotional stuff, then you throw on top of that, the technological yeah. differences. Right. And that just, Makes the barrier, yeah. Makes the the ocean between them even farther apart. Yes, and and uh, I don't do it as much in this book as I had in the last book because you have to kind of you know choose yeah. where you put the focus. But but some of the humor is um, 
is with how 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 the mom say, mom say things or you know of of yeah. just how they don't understand some things that are very simple like my mother is obsessed with whatsapp like all indian mother <laughs> you know i mean seriously it's so this woman has gone from oh i don't know how to text i don't want to do that to you know 500 messages <laughs> and, you know, every joke someone sends you, you do not need to send to me. It's not even funny. But she's like, but I want to share my, you know, it, I laughed, so I wanted to share it with you. And so it's like there is a reason how I'm, you know, why, why we are not continuously together. You do not need to share everything. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's it is. I'm so I, guilty of that, though. I feel like your mom. I get it. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was on Snapchat for like two days before the kids booted me off. Like so they literally took it off my phone. <laughs> my kids would not. You know, with my old phone, now I finally have emojis. In my old phone, my kids did not, you know, they had disabled emojis. Because apparently, a big, I'm not worthy of them. I know that, that, <laughs> that, I, that misuse is, you know, is, is, a, is a crime. And... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah there's, there's nothing more humiliating than being unfriended on Snapchat by your own children, <laughs> or like they stop sharing their location. They <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, adult the the crossover when your children turn into adults. Yes, you know, yes, is, yeah, is probably that, no. the the greatest amounts of ego bashing <laughs> <laughs> and you. But oh yeah, my, my son did unfollow me on Facebook. Facebook, <laughs> if I if I made a post with him or posted a picture, and I'm very careful, you know, about what I say about them. And you know, when they were kids, yeah. I didn't. Until they were adults, I didn't really post their pictures. Um, and and it ta it self tags, and so I would say something if I said something, you know, kind of, you know, how you, yeah. you say mom stuff. <laughs> And then all his friends saw the post because it was tagged. I was like, I didn't tag you, I promise. I oh, saw no. tag you. And he was like, unfollow, unfriend. <laughs> no way. You're cut off. He, he, blocked, oh. he blocked me. He like actually blocked me. Oh no, see, that, that's that's rough. That's rough. Because because he was like, and if you don't unblock, then you can't, then I can still tag you. And he was like, You're really yeah. tagging me in anything yeah. ever again. And and this child is kind of you know traumatized by the whole thing because I have to tell this story, is uh, when Bollywood Bride came out, um, he was in freshman year high school, and there are <laughs> that's the story. I'm not to call today. Theme <laughs> of the day, but um, yeah, so he was in his um, and and Bol these books don't are all closed door in terms of sex yeah, because yeah. you know I mean it is structurally Austin anyway they don't really get together until the very end and when they get together the story's over which is kind of uh, faithful to being an austin retelling but but bollywood bride has uh, the books before this have you know ha have fairly graphic um lo uh, sex scenes in them <laughs> and this poor child was in his cafeteria and the girls and his friend broke group read the scene out loud in the cafeteria oh wow oh, no oh my gosh that that is scarring oh. that is scarring so oh, i blame him for blocking me he's totally forgiven yeah <laughs> well sonali one of the other things i absolutely loved about this book was all the food and i was telling diana also i eat like a lumberjack <laughs> so i'm all about food and books like just and the way you described it was yeah. just that, that, was just that, amazing and so, especially the tea. I want you to make me cry. I know, me too. I'm all about the tea. I'm, I'm, I'm the chai Nazi. I, you know, <laughs> it, it has to be exactly so. And it has to be um, the first thing I do in the morning. You know, it, it's that whole don't talk to me until I have my coffee mm -hmm. multiplied over because it's like, you know, really seriously. My And it's very simple. I boil what, you know, it's ginger. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing I'll put in my chai is lemongrass if I can find it. But otherwise, it's, it's you know, it's just ginger tea. But that's the thing I miss most at conferences or when, when I travel. Oh. I'm just like, someone just get me. I have actually carried, like, you know, a piece of ginger root with me so I can just dunk it in the in the tea bag. <laughs> it doesn't cut it. But I'm, I'm definitely a, a, a Chai Nazi. With the food, I think I was... Um, 
I was a little concerned when I started writing this book because in, in Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors, DJ is also a chef, but he's a chef who loves what he does, right? This man yeah. lives for food. That's how he communicates with people around him, right? That's how he nurtures. That's how he unravels people. That's his, you know, his language is food. And in fact, we call him, you know, he's called the food whisperer by anyone who knows him. Ashna is the opposite of that. I mean, Ashna has a very complicated and painful relationship with cooking and food. Mm -hmm. uh, because right. You can't even cook to, to start with. I know. A panic attack. Yeah. And I like that it wasn't about weight. Like it wasn't yeah. about her weight, which you yeah. often find in yeah. books. It yeah. was this her emotional reaction to food. Yeah, and, and that whole, like, her father's power over her, yes, you know, extends beyond the grave to food and right. has this right. hold on her. And the whole journey is her kind of getting up off the floor, you know, from the moment that he died. You know, yeah. that Recognizing what had been done to her yeah. and that yeah. she was continuing to do it to herself. That was, that, very, powerful. That was very powerful. But I yeah. love the fact she was able to make an omelet, though. That made me very happy for her. <laughs> Oh no, I was I was in rack when she went on the show. I, I know, I was too. Yeah. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Yeah, and, and and so so she I mean she she can cook, she which is I think true of anybody. I mean, you know, people say, Oh, you're such a great cook. It's it's not rocket science, you know. My yeah. apologies to everybody who is a great cook. And I consider myself it's my mom always says that it's a matter of love. Like anything, you you know, anyone who likes food, likes to cook and likes people is going right. to, you know, be a good cook. So it's just a matter of effort and wanting to do it, right? It's not rocket science. And so, um, you know, of course, taking it to a, to a level of, you know, fine cuisine might be. Right, right. right. Being creative with, with food it. is different, yeah. But, yes. but, but for her... It is so, so it is being bound by her father's recipes and it's being bound by that power that he has over her. So so I was a little nervous because people had loved the food aspect of Pride and Prejudice. And right. when I started writing this, there was almost this, you know, it, it was an ugly thing. Her relationship with food is an ugly thing and with mm -hmm. cooking. And and so I was a little concerned about, you know, how that was going to be. But then as I, you know, the journey of writing that book it becomes a way for them to come together. It becomes a way for her to find herself. And even just the challenges, I felt like, you know, it, it was such a way that they inch back toward each other. And culturally, how without even like making it a thing, it, it, it just kind of is a representation of how how they see each other. You know, right. it's, it's they, they're able to see each other. And and I think the food speaks to that, where it's not like, oh, is that your curry? And are those your, you know, it, uh, it, brigaderos? But it's it's more just just understanding each other through food and how that starts, you know, how that threads them back together. And so in the end, it ended up being, um, I don't think I could ever really make food an ugly thing. Um, right. You know, and, and, and I was concerned, but it didn't end up being that. No, it was lovely. No, it and was I love the whole thing about the churros oh, and, love that. Churros and, and songs tacos. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's an interesting character. I had fun right. I mean, it's such a small Oh, character. you could tell. I could tell how much you loved writing him. Because, you, uh, you know, and I thought what was interesting, what I really loved was that in his first scene, she came up immediately where it wasn't, he was not in her first scene. Yes. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you, we knew there was going to, I mean, I, I knew because I've read your books that there was going to be a romance, but it wasn't primary in her initial scenes. It was primary in his. In his. At least it becomes by the end of that scene. It becomes, you know. Yes. Yes. By the end of the scene. But, but you know it's coming. Like you could just tell it's yeah. coming. <laughs> but, with yeah. her, but with Asha, she has so many other issues going on. And so she's also a much more repressed character. Yes, I would, yes, I would agree with that. Is much, much longer than Rico's is. And, um, you know, I mean, R Rico's journey in that sense is, is simple, but he's also the kind of person who is... Um, is very once and done. It's part of his personality, right? He is, right. Um, and, and it's that athlete personality again, right? I mean, it's the goal. 
I see nothing else, right? And right. so, so it's and that's why he's unable to get it. I mean, there are many reasons why he's unable to get her out of his system, but um, but it it uh, it's primarily that his journey is uh, you know, is that he's lost something, and it's not that. It's of course he's repressed that you know the fact right. that he's unable to move on for a reason, but it's not it's it's on the surface still. It's not kind you know it's not well, he, his history is too that he takes something that that bad that's happened to him like he took the the breakup and right. used that to launch himself forward and now he has the injury and he's using that to launch himself forward again. He just yeah. you know so yeah. you can tell you feel like he's going to be okay. Yes. With her, you worry more because she's just, she's holding it all in. Well, and she has so many emotional wounds coming yeah. from so many places. Yeah. Right, right. And she, yeah, and, and his, his emotional wounds are, again, you know, I mean, I love that you said that, Diana, because his emotional wounds, when you really think about it, are not shallow. No, because his no. parents were, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, well, yeah. everything he went through. So, but but he, just how he sees it, is uh you know is is a little bit simpler than what has happened to her is just that the amount of entanglement is but but again it comes down to you know he essentially had a happy childhood yeah you know this is an awful thing that happens to him but he his his and she says it she thinks it you know he was precious to his parents and he never doubted that even though they yeah. had their own you know and he yeah and he chose a career where he could externalize his pain where yeah. she had to internalize all of it all the time yes and she did have that for a while where she had a thing she loved that gave her again right. like punishment right i mean she walks away from that right. um, and and she's so she's stuck in the cycle of self-punishment right and, um, yeah. you know which is why i think we worry so much about her but i also think which is why she is relatable you know i, mean, I would agree and I think right. just like the original heroine was relatable. And why you were so her when that. she does decide to do something different, when she decides to make that drastic change, and, yeah. you know, and to go on television, you really root for her because you know how difficult it is for her. She has been stuck yeah. in that loop for a very long time. And you see yeah. that from yeah. the, the very beginning, uh, stuck in this restaurant that's not working and she loses her chef you know, in the first pages and yeah, yeah, it's very difficult for her. Yeah. And, and, and I love that you also, you know, one of the central themes to her as a character is, is, you know, is this whole thing that keeps coming up because people will tell you all the time that the definition, you know, of I mean, is doing the same thing and expecting different results. We yeah. hear it all the time. Like it's everyone's favorite thing to throw out. Right. And she actually is, you know, and I love this about Ashna. She's like, Ugh. one more person says that to me. I'm going to like literally you know, wring their neck. And, and, um, and, and the funny thing that turns out is a little by accident and a little by just having the gumption to do it. She does that, right? I mean, she, she makes, a you know, she makes that tweak, she does a different thing, because she wants a different result. And when that, you know, apple cart starts rolling, she's like, Oh, can I take it back? <laughs> you know, and she does try. Yeah, she's like, wait a minute, maybe I can yeah. go, go, to call my mom and <laughs> yeah. yeah but you pushed her in a really great emotional corner like you had mm. her battered from all sides before she really said yes like before she was like committed committed you know what i mean like i thought it was great yeah i mean i think easy journeys don't make for great stories they make a great good life mm -hmm. you know and i wish it upon everybody uh you know it, it, but but easy journeys and and not just to torture um the character, but I think it's a, it's even for a reader, you don't want to have a difficult journey in real life. Right. So it's easier to learn lessons from and relate your own life to someone else's difficult journey, right? Right. And so right. Um, so, yeah. so it's, it works in stories really well. Yeah, she was a very inspirational character. I would agree. I agree. Totally yeah. agree. Because you did, you did relate to her, and you did see, you know, the difficulty of, um, you know, being labeled a certain way and having to fight that, especially when she she was doing it to herself. I, and I just thought she was fantastic. I loved the whole story. I completely oh, agree with it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Can I, can I ask you just not only when you wrote it, do you write linearly? Like, do you write scene by scene by scene? Or how did you put this one together? Um, really good question. No, I don't. Um, I, I have this. So I don't completely write out of order. But I think I write, um, write like emotionally powerful scenes mm -hmm. when they come to me. Right. So, and, and I have this, this arc where I know the, the emotional points of growth and, you know, and regressing that characters are going to hit. So as that comes to me, I will write that down. And, and, um, and, and, you know, and then I know that, oh my gosh, I've written a scene where this meeting has happened and I've, you know, written a scene where they're together. Right. Like, oh, I have all of this, but but how is that journey going to happen? And so, so there's a lot of filling in. It's a it's a completely ridiculous uh, process. It's I wish it were <laughs> more sensible. No, it sounds like you do a lot of what I do. Is I I write and then I go back and then I oh you know. So I'm I'm almost like weaving. You know, it's it's yeah. weaving and and you know. All of my all all the magic happens in rewriting. All of it, like yeah, my I would agree with that. Are just horrendous. Like it's word vomit. It's there's no other <laughs> word. For it. I have to, you know, I have to actually just get that thing out of me, mm -hmm. and then I can, you know, make beauty from it. For sure, that's my process. And so, so writing a first draft is a just like not a. You know, now I'm coming to the end of this one, so I'm starting to feel some of the joy. But if you had talked to me like a month ago. I'm in this miserable place where it's yeah. I just hate this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. Of course, my my best case scenario would be that someone gives me a really ugly story that's all written down. <laughs> then you just fix it, <laughs> and I can do yeah. you know great things with it. And then yeah. you don't care about it. You're like, here's my ugly story, and I'll be like, ah, oh, now and then, my, because my brain works that way. I can you know because right. I. See your story. I can see what it really is, and of course, when it's my own, even when I vomited it out, I knew mm. what I wanted to do with it. Right. And right. I, I actually, it's my favorite part of writing is you have this story in your head. Yeah. And you want to do all these things with it, and 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 there is, and I know you both know this. Is there's that moment when you have been tweaking the story for you know for a year and a hundred revisions and there's a moment when you read it and you're like wow this is right. exactly what i was going for and this is exactly where i wanted to end up and um and why did i not like it 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 feels like that was it's in its first like this it has come out like this whole and i think that right. way, when you find that uh you know that's the best that, feeling in the world the yeah. best feeling in the world yeah. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Well, and you had some great, great one-liners, Sonali. I found I mean, I cried like Diana, but I also laughed. Like, oh I, yeah, so did I. <laughs> um, I mean, when I was laughing so hard when um, Nina was talking about meeting her husband for lunch after the <laughs> outside scene, and she's, I'm just gonna read it. She goes, and this is Mina talking about her husband, and they're older. She goes, I haven't had lunch dates with him in a while, and here I am always going on about how you can't let your marriage sag like old breasts. This is going to be <laughs> fabulous. I just started laughing because that's something my mother would say. That's something my mom would say. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm like, we're always like, Mom, no sex jokes. Don't, you know, don't uh, do that. <laughs> I know. My mom's the same way. She's like always throwing stuff out like that. I'm like, oh, my, I just can't deal. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I feel I do it a lot with my kids, and I feel like I do it so well. <laughs> <laughs> they don't agree. They're like, Mom. But no. in the midst of all the emotion, you just, all of a sudden, you would just say something like, oh, I love the one where she, um, she was thinking, Ashna was thinking about Rico and she was like, he was a hero, she was a wreck. And then she says, says to China, you know, I don't have a celebrity anymore because I broke him. <laughs> she literally <laughs> did break him, like his knee split open. Or, you know. <laughs> just, I, just little things like that just was what they were wonderful. That Does yeah. that kind of stuff come in the rewriting, do you think? Some of it, you know, some of it does and some of it doesn't. I think mm -hmm. a lot of that, uh, you know, is me, Basically, having fun when I'm doing something I'm not enjoying, which is writing the first draft. <laughs> so this is the stuff that makes writing the first draft, right. you know, 
bearable is because I can be silly. Some of it does kind of get layered in. One of my, and I, I think I'm the only one who finds this insanely funny. I don't think I, you know, it translates into great humor on paper. <laughs> But there is there is a scene when he squeezes DJ's bicep by mistake. Oh. <laughs> it cracks me. That up. is so funny. Yeah, so funny. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, did you really? I mean, I don't. Because it made him so human, right? <laughs> because he's like this yeah. star, and he's gorgeous, <laughs> and he touches the woman, and now he's accidentally grabbing another man's bicep. I know that was terrible. Yeah. yeah, and I just. And, and that was that was a heavy scene that I wanted to actually lighten up. So I was, you know, I wanted to to do that. I wanted to kind of humanize, um, you know, human. Give them, give him a silly side because in my head, Rico is very comfortable with himself. Like right. his, the best thing about, and that's the thing she sees about him is that he is so comfortable in his skin. So and so alone, though. I mean, his his aloneness is just heartbreaking. It's oh, heartbreaking until he meets her, and that's again is why he kind of is you know he he like swallows her whole in terms of you know internalizing her, and that's just his personality. But he is, he he's you know he's so comfortable with his own silliness, with his own you know he he's there's there's no like he can make fun of his his world's toxic ma masculinity he's very in touch with his feminine side yeah. and, you know in a very strange sort of way when he's an athlete so so this act of him you know just being jealous when he knows it's ridiculous to be jealous and then squeezing the bicep of another <laughs> man it's just it was you know i mean it just delighted me so much that's you know because it's this whole i didn't do that did you think <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious <laughs> so i so, so that was, you know, and we can all relate. You know, we can all yeah. relate to those all moments those where things, yeah. you know, like sitting in a work meeting and calling your boss "papa" by mistake. <laughs> and it's like, right. um, but you're hang up on your boss, and you're like, "I love you." No, wait. I oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Or see you later, sweetie. Right. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, "Can someone kill me? Like right now? <laughs> I just need to die." <laughs> Oh, it's so funny. Delightful. And it was, it's was it been so great having you here today. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe it's an hour. I know. I know. It goes by so quickly. Thank you so much, Sonali, for coming on. Thank really, you. really appreciate Thank it. You. This was so fun. I mean, you know, it's it's I, I hope it was fun for you. But oh, yeah. yeah I loved it. Yeah. To sit here and have, you know, two two authors you admired you know kind of take the time to tell you exactly what they loved about the book it's you know oh, I mean, you're so sweet for saying that sharon I I, when you came on sharon and i were both saying that your book had changed us it, it was yes it's just very much impacted us and so thank it was, you so much. yeah it was, it was just phenomenal so i'm really really hoping to see this book on a list sonali yeah <laughs> Thank you. It's so, one step at a time, you know. Yep, yep, just one step at a time. Can you believe how far do you think you would have sold if you hadn't finaled in the golden heart? Do you think the golden heart is what really helped? You know this, right? Okay, so everyone should know Sharon and I are Lucky 13 sisters. So That's right, I forgot to mention that, yeah. From the same uh um golden heart class of 2013, uh which we you know ended up being a very tight circle. Yeah. And um so Sharon, when I finaled, I had already sold. Oh, I did not I know, know that. that. No, yeah, I did not know that. Maybe I just forgot. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I forgot. Sorry. Everyone knew that. Everyone knew that. And it was um, you know, it's it's a uh, my journey, you know, was naturally kind of um a, a, a little, you know, a little weird how you know how I finaled and how I sold and all of it was felt completely impossible until it had happened right. and um and 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 i don't think any number of uh of finals or anything would have you know would have sold my book if at that point the publisher i sold to didn't have an opening for an indian book you know oh, wow. something like that you know and uh, and i'm glad it was mine and you know it's it's luck is opportunity meeting hard work right, and right. All of that. And it was a great book 
But right. yeah, thank you. So, I mean, you know, I, and I, I love that about your work. I love that I get to see a, another culture that I'm not very familiar with. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's what I know and uh, it's what I write, but, but I am focusing on the story. You know, I think yeah. my book focuses right. on the story, not the culture and, and, and which is what I always set out to do. And I think what I'm really fortunate about is in that I have, um, I have always had editors and publishers and not a lot of people can say this, certainly not a lot of people, uh, you know, who write diverse books can say this, is uh, that I've always somehow found, uh, you know, found publishers and editors who wanted me, were completely okay with the story I wanted to tell, how I wanted to tell it. I've never had, you know, once I had sold, I have never had pushback or any kind of um, you know, someone trying to. Your books are universal and I find the cultural aspects just fill in the color behind it all. Thank you, yes, and, I, and that's exactly what they are, but I think that's how almost all, any any book set yeah. in any diverse culture are. Or, I agree. You know, I mean, LGBTQ books, any kind of book is about the story. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is about being gay or about being black or about, you know. Right, or, right. All we're trying to do is trying to tell tell a story, um, you know, which is uh, which is our truth in terms of who uh, the you know who the characters are and who that world is. Yeah, and it's, they're richer for it. I think it was you know, it's just lovely. Right. But, thank you. Thank you. But yeah. So so Sharon. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I think that that um, that other things in the universe had to fall in place for me to sell, and I'm glad that they did. I'm so glad it did, Snolly. I'm so glad. I'm so glad we final together. That was a great yes. year. And and you and your journey, such a huge inspiration. So oh. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> You're so sweet. <laughs> and we're all I'm still done. on it. So thanks again so uh, much, Sonali. And when is your next you. book coming out? I think it'll be May next year. May and, 20. I keep yeah. saying May 2020 because I think we're in 2019. Oh, my. <laughs> no. Yeah. We're skipping. Uh, does it have a title? No, it does not. I okay. am very attached to its working title, but uh, it does not. Okay. okay. We all know you don't get to carry title. Put that out there. All right. Well, yeah. thank okay. you so very much. Thanks so much, Sonari. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great weekend. You both. Thank you.